As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. I now recognize our first witness, Mr. James Martin from the Environmental Protection Agency. And I'm the regional administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency's Region 8. Uh, that is a region that encompasses the Dakotas, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. I'm here, to talk, here today to talk with you about the agency's groundwater investigation at Pavilion, Wyoming. In the spring of 2008, EPA staff at our regional office were contacted by a group of people from the rural community of Pavilion in central Wyoming. They had noticed a change in their drinking water, in its odor, its taste, and its color, and wanted to know not only what had happened, but whether their water was safe to drink. While the state had directed their operating company to test the water, the results were inconclusive and left the residents without those critical answers. After conferring with our state colleagues and with the northern Arapaho and eastern Shoshone tribes of the Wind River Indian Reservation, EPA agreed in 2008 to conduct additional sampling. To ensure as thorough an approach as possible, we developed a plan that included a broad list of compounds at the lowest levels of detection. We conducted our initial round of sampling in March 2009. We looked at both domestic drinking water wells and at two of the wells that serve the town pavilion just west of the, of the pavilion oil and gas field. We found that roughly a third of the domestic wells had detections of organic compounds, including methane, total petroleum hydrocarbons, and some other organics the lab was able to tentatively identify but not quantify. Our phase two sampling was again planned in collaboration with the tribes, the state, and the operating company, in this case in Canna. Our goal was to better quantify the chemicals present in order to assess potential health risks and to identify potential sources. Again, we considered a wide range of potential sources in developing the sampling plan. The sampling plan, the sampling rather, occurred in January of 2010, but in a more refined area based on the results from our phase one sampling. Again, we confirmed that organic chemicals of concern were present in 16 of the 17 domestic well samples including methane and petroleum hydrocarbons. We also sampled shallow pit monitoring wells and found very high concentrations of several contaminants. We shared our data with the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Based both on those data and on a set of uncertainties, that agency recommended that residents use an alternative source of water for drinking and cooking and that they ventilate their bathrooms while running their showers. However, we concluded that without future data, Further data, rather, we still could not identify potential sources of the contamination. Another round of consultation with stakeholders occurred, and we then decided to construct two deep monitoring wells. Those wells were constructed in the summer of 2007, 2010, rather, and we collected samples from both wells on two separate occasions. Throughout, we applied the most stringent quality assurance protocols used by the agency. Those results showed very high alkalinity at deeper, level, deeper levels of the aquifer, petroleum-related organic compounds, including benzene, at 50 times the maximum contamination level set by the Safe Drinking Water Act, and a number of synthetic organic compounds that do not occur naturally in groundwater. EPA's technical team evaluated these data with great care and weighed a range of possible explanations that might fit the entire data set as well as the regional geology and the field production practices. Based upon multiple lines of reasoning, we have tentatively concluded that, in, that the drinking water aquifer contains compounds likely associated with gas production activities, including hydraulic fracturing. We make clear in the draft report that our analysis is limited to the particular geologic conditions in the pavilion gas field and should not be assumed to apply to fracturing in other geologic settings. It should be noted that fracturing in pavilion is taking place in and below the drinking water aquifer and in close proximity to drinking water wells. As we were moving toward completion of the report, we asked three external scientists to review the sampling and analysis as a sort of final check-in. We also broadly shared the data and then conducted a series of meetings with the state, the tribes, BLM and BIA and the company to gather their concerns and assessments. In late 2011, we released the draft report. We provided notice of our intention to subject this report to a formal external peer review. 
by scientists and engineers unaffiliated with EPA. Contemporaneously, we sought public comment on the draft report and have since extended the deadline for comment to March 12. To support this review, we have released an unprecedented amount of raw data, quality assurance documentation, and other supporting information. In addition, we are working with the state, the tribes, and others to develop a plan for additional investigation at the site. In conclusion, I believe EPA acted carefully, thoughtfully, and transparently in responding to the concerns raised by local residents in 2008. We have applied the highest standards of scientific rigor and have operated in the spirit of transparency and collaboration. There is more work to be done, and collaboration and transparency will continue to be the hallmarks of our investigation. With that, I yield the floor, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now recognize our second witness, Mr. Tom Dahl, from the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Thank you. Um, I am here uh, this morning rep as a representative of the Honorable Governor of the State of Wyoming, Matthew H. Mead, and provide the following testimony regarding the EPA's groundwater science at Pavilion, Wyoming. The Pavilion Wind River Formation natural gas field was discovered in 1960. By 2006, full field development was completed. This greater Pavilion gas field has 168 wells. Currently, there are 78 wells on tribal and 58 wells on private minerals. The last wells in this greater pavilion gas field area that were hydraulically fractured were, occurred in 2007. In 2008, EPA reacted to complaints from a few domestic well owners claiming taste and odor problems following hydraulic fracturing at nearby gas production wells. EPA conducted sampling and testing of 42 shallow domestic and stock water wells, um, and in August 2010, results of that testing was made public. EPA drilled two monitoring wells in the Pavilion Natural Gas Field in the summer of 2010. Both monitoring wells were completed at depths considerably below that of the shallow water supply wells. EPA via email notified the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality of the plan to drill the monitoring wells literally as the rig was moving in. And so I would question whether that is consultation with the state or not. Sampling of the two monitoring wells occurred in October 2010 and again in April 2011. Data was made public in November followed by the pavilion draft report on groundwater in December 2011. The complex geology of the Wind River Formation in central Wyoming makes identification of potential contamination pathways difficult. The sands are discontinuous and are individual lens, lenses within a shale matrix. Visualize individual potato chips layered in a bowl. Some are in contact and most are not. The Wind River Formation is the shallow aquifer and is also the deep natural gas reservoir. EPA's draft report is based on two monitoring well sampling events. EPA found a single detect of two butoxyethanol out of nine lab samples analyzed using an analytical method still under development. Actual sample values for organics are so low they are measured in parts per billion. This chemical compound at the 12.7 parts per billion detected is acceptable for drinking water supplied from a public water system. The EPA review of material safety data sheets found two butoxyethanol as a compound in foam, add, foam additives used in hydraulic fracturing, but ignored its use in other applications such as metal coatings and solvents. EPA concluded that hydraulic fracturing caused groundwater contamination. Now I'd like to focus on the natural gas wells in the immediate area of these two EPA monitoring wells. None of these natural gas wells have been hydraulically fractured since 2005. EPA's data is only applicable to the natural gas field in central Wyoming. This fact is lost in the public reaction to the EPA announcement and a worldwide damnation of hydraulic fracturing has occurred. The report provides no data to show how these two EPA monitoring wells represent water supply wells used by anyone in the pavilion natural gas field. Wyoming State Agency's technical questions have yet to be addressed. And I've been informed now that the uh, new data has been released and posted on the EPA webpage. 
The EPA report also ignores the ongoing public outreach investigation of natural gas well integrity and landowner identified sites. EPA has not addressed other possible surface pathways of groundwater contamination. Wyoming state agency scientists contend that chemical compounds detected were introduced during the drilling, completion, testing, and sampling of the EPA monitoring wells. Further, well testing is required. Wyoming has historically regulated hydraulic fracturing. Since 2010, Wyoming is the only state to require chemical disclosure prior to the initiation of the treatment. Disclosure of the actual chemical compounds used is also required post-treatment. This well information is public and is posted on the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission webpage. In conclusion, the EPA Pavilion Draft Report contains poor quality data and science. State of Wyoming experts do not support the EPA's data or analysis and recommend further testing before any conclusion of groundwater contamination by any source be made. The goal is for residents of Pavilion to have clean water and conclusive answers about the source of the area's groundwater problems. Additional short-term sampling and long-term science-based efforts are being planned by the, United, by the State of Wyoming and the USGS for the Pavilion area. Thank you for providing this opportunity to address this subcommittee regarding Pavilion Wyoming. Thank you very much. I now recognize our third witness, Ms. Kathleen Sagama from the Western Energy Alliance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Miller and members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity today. Western Energy Alliance represents about 400 companies engaged in all aspects of environmentally responsible oil and gas development in Wyoming and across the West. There is no fail-safe process, and accidents may happen with any human endeavor. One of the main roles of environmental regulation is to ensure that the risk is managed properly, that appropriate procedures are in place to prevent public exposure, and in the event of an accident, that problems are corrected. Oil and natural gas producers are held to high scientific standards to ensure operations are properly designed, executed, and controlled. Because civil or criminal penalties can be levied on producers who fail to fulfill regulatory requirements, it's imperative that regulators are also held to high standards. Regulators must be required to show that sound science and correct procedures were followed when establishing regulations and when determining if a company failed to meet a regulatory standard. If sound science and accepted regulatory practices are not followed, findings cannot stand up in court and arbitrary regulatory practices sow uncertainty. As a democratic society, the legal culpability inherent in our regulatory system is not the only consideration. The court of public opinion is also important. Without public support, activities such as oil and natural gas development would not be possible. My industry struggles against outrageous information in the public arena and that overstates our environmental impact and propagates blatantly false information about hydraulic fracturing. Every day we hear members of the media and unaccountable environmental groups make statements about supposedly thousands of cases of contamination. Never mind that EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson and most regulators from large oil and natural gas producing states have felt compelled to issue statements about the lack of cases of contamination from fracking. Once misinformation gets out in the public, it takes on a life of its own and is almost impossible to correct. This misinformation has caused local communities and citizens to fear a process that is safe. The fear leads to development roadblocks, depriving state economies of tens of thousands of jobs and billions of dollars of economic activity. Furthermore, unfounded fears about fracking divert limited federal and state resources away from activities that truly pose a threat to underground sources of drinking water. The Groundwater Protection Council considers fracking low risk, especially compared to other threats such as agricultural runoff, septic systems, sewer lines, and wastewater treatment sources. The public trusts EPA to follow the law and use sound science as the foundation of its regulatory work. When EPA releases a, state, a report stating that fracking may be the cause of contamination, the public expects that to be backed by science. However, in the case of the draft pavilion report, EPO's, EPA's own data contained within doesn't support the conclusions presented up front. A conclusion with such broad implications should have first been tested through a scientific peer review of the work. We are left wondering why EPA would jump to conclusions. 
why would EPA release the report without state input and scientific peer review? These are disturbing questions to ask about an agency that should have the public trust and points to the fact that EPA is also a political body, not a disinterested scientific institution. As this committee knows, fundamental standards of science include objectivity, repeatability, transparency, and peer review. It's hard to call something scientific if it doesn't include these basic elements, yet we've seen examples from EPA that do not. Industry is particularly concerned since Congress has charged EPA with conducting a scientific study of fracking. EPA's recent actions raise questions in our minds about the quality of the science for the broader, for the broader fracking study as well. The pavilion report and what we've observed so far in the fracking study cause great concern to industry as we see a lack of transparency, unscientific methods, and failure to perform peer review. I ask this committee to help ensure that the issues of scientific credibility are resolved. I believe in general that better oversight is needed of EPA science. There's an inherent conflict given EPA's regulatory and compliance roles and its ability to conduct objective science. Given that conflict, it is, ex it is especially important that EPA science be properly peer-reviewed. Western Energy Alliance recommends that standards for EPA-conducted science be tightened. Fracking is vital to the supply of American energy. If we lose the public's confidence and, can, can, and cannot continue to develop oil and natural gas in the United States because of unfounded rumors and invalid science, America will deprive itself of significant job and economic growth and will continue to import energy from unfriendly countries. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I recognize our fourth and final witness, Dr. Bernard Goldstein of the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health. Doctor. testify. Uh, I apologize, but I will be showing slides. It's part of uh, being a professor. I'd lose my professorial appointment. Um, my three major points are that there is, uh, that the public is genuinely concerned about the potential health impacts, and there's genuine reason for the concern, and that there's almost no support for the research needed to uh, respond to the public, and that lack of support is both short-sighted and counterproductive. Uh, there's a fair amount of public confusion, which I think is really important to put in context of this particular hearing. Uh, the public is hearing that hydrofracking is a new technology that now permits extraction in our area of the country. It's the Marcellus Shale. And oh, by the way, it's been around for decades, but so don't worry. It can't be both. Uh, decades ago, a hydrofracking was done with 50,000 gallons of water straight shot down vertical, uh, uh, no horizontal drilling. Now it's five to eight million gallons. Uh, there's all these additional bells and whistles that have been added to it. And we are told, although there's a lot of secrecy, that the fracking chemicals have been changed. We're also uh, uh, confused about the fact that, uh, just as we're hearing here, there's no proof that hydrofracking uh, has ever caused groundwater contamination. Well. That's a technical definition of hydrofracking, which has to do with the release 5,000 foot underground or 1,000 foot underground of these chemicals. It is not really what the public understands as hydrofracking, which is anything that happens with these chemicals from the time that the drill pad, uh, the, the, uh, drill pad is level to 20 years from now when uh, we hope everybody goes away and, and everything is, is restored to where it was. So that this confusion is, is very much behind uh, causing even anger by folks. Uh, this is an analysis of the reasons given by those not in favor of Marcellus drilling, and you'll see that health concerns are, are a large part of this. Uh, part of the reason for concern is unnecessary secrecy. My example of how uh, ludicrous this is comes from the Gulf oil spill. Uh, secrecy about this particular component, this organic sulfonic acid salt at the bottom, this proprietary drug, contributed greatly to the stress experienced by Gulf residents. It turns out that this secret ingredient is a commonly used over-the-counter stool softener. We have often prescribed, and I can tell that at least one of us in this room has used, uh, it's of no toxicological <laughs> significance to humans. I don't know about the fish, but why do we keep this secret? Uh, 
One of my major concerns as a toxicologist and as a physician is the mixture issue. We have lots of chemicals that are being used. They're continually changing. We don't know what's in there. I can't be responsive to someone who calls and says, my kid has such and such problems. I'm worried about this disease because I don't really know what's being done there. Um, and not only do we have this concern about the individual chemicals, there's this mixture issue, plus there's even a greater mixture issue having to do with the fracking uh, fluids that return, the uh, uh, produce water, the uh, flowback water, which contain not only the residual fracking chemicals, but also everything that's been brought up from underground. And we don't really know what's going to happen with these flowback fluids. Uh, I can't, in this brief presentation, do more than, than list uh, some of the potential health issues that should be addressed. And I must respectfully dis disagree with the distinguished chair about the importance of index cases. Uh, in my experience, index cases are simply not very germane to environmental medicine. Uh, let me cite our analysis of um, the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection's uh, data on violations by companies involved in Marcellus drilling, shale drilling. Some of these companies are to be commended. They've had no violations. Some should not be in business. And as long as that persists, we're going to have major problems. And. Uh, Finally, it's, it's, it's disappointing that despite the fact that the various advisory committees have been put together, this is the President, the Governor of Maryland, the Governor of Pennsylvania, that really look at health and welfare and, and are concerned about protection of public health. We've examined uh, these three advisory committees. There are 52 members, and there's nobody with any health background in any of these advisory committees, no physicians, nurses, uh, toxicologists, risk assessors, etc. So let me conclude with what I think are three certainties of what are going to happen. First, there's going to be surprises. There already have been. Uh, bromides in water, uh, earthquakes. Uh, there will be improved technology. Uh, industry has to pay for their fracking chemicals. It's in their interest to recycle them. Industry uh, uh, should not be releasing uh, the uh, chemicals that come out, in fact, because they should be selling them. They want to sell them. But we found over these past 40 years that it requires a lot of oversight, a lot of rigorous oversight to make this happen. It won't happen by itself. And finally, there certainly will be adverse health impacts that are going to be reported in these various areas. They will be statistically significant. That doesn't mean they're causal. There's enough different diseases in different areas. People are going to wake up and say, we've never had this much pancreatic cancer or autism or leukemia before those drilling, those wells were drilled. And at that point, to try to figure out in retrospect what's really going on is a little too late. It's cost ineffective to do it then. We need to start doing it now if we're going to be able to get the greatest benefit we can. Or, in fact, what will, the decisions will be made based upon litigation, not based upon science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, and I, and I sympathize with you because, you know, when I, I was an academician, and whenever I would give a talk, I always gave it from slides, so then I get into the legislation, find you don't do that anymore. <laughs> but I, I thank you very much for, the, for your presentation.